Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Crime Centric. This being a show where I talk about crime dramas that I watch. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of Instinct, as well as the latest episode of Deception. Like always, if I'm talking about something that you want to listen to, you can always look in the description down below. I include a time and I start talking about each of the respective shows. So, for example, if you want to hear what I say about this week's episode of Instinct, you can skip to what I had to say about this week's episode of Deception. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is this week's episode of Instinct. So, in this episode, uh, Dylan and Lizzie deal with kind of a pretty Pretty brutal case that turns into not necessarily a serial killer because it's kind of interesting hearing how Dylan kind of specifies like serial killers just kind of like a little bit of a break in between but spree killers kind of don't because Caleb was like for well technically it was like the photographer first and then like Caleb was like the next day within like the next 24 hours or something like that he ended up dying so. Um, it was an interesting case because I was trying to figure out, like, okay, like, what is this all about? Because first it's like, okay, there's this crazy dude named Gene, and obviously Caleb had a girlfriend named Nikki, and she's involved in all And so I was trying to figure everything out because obviously everything points to Gene at first, and it was kind of like, I thought he was going to play a bigger role in it because I was like, I didn't think Gene did it, but I was just thinking, like, especially with the angle of, like, oh, yeah, my parents are going to get the lawyers involved, so I'm like, it's like he's taking credit for it or something. He didn't actually do it, did he? Uh, but then you had the whole situation with Nikki, which the actress who played Nikki, I kept looking like, why do you, why do I, why she looks so familiar? And I was like, oh yeah, it's the actress uh, who played the daughter. I'm blanking on her name right now, her character's name in particular. But in the TV show The Mist, that was she, she's the one who played the daughter. I was like, oh my god, which is crazy because you go from that to like, oh yeah, you're playing a sociopath in this episode because it turns out she's the killer. The moment she showed up with the whole like. Um, Amnesia thing, I was like, that's a little auspicious, like, auspicious, God, um, suspicious, <laughs> why I said auspicious, uh, it just seemed a little suspicious, you just randomly having um, amnesia like that, I'm like, okay, I, I guess so, and just like some of her reactions, I mean, I, I guess it makes sense, but I think Dylan kind of picked up on it too, because it was the whole, her reaction of like, what did you think, how did you feel when you saw him, like when you saw uh, what he did to Caleb, and it was like, I was just thinking it could have been me, I was like, even though I was kind of like, hmm, that's, I mean, I get that that makes sense, but at the same time, it's like, it, I could see it like in retrospect, it's like, yeah, that didn't seem like it bothered you. So, and I also appreciate when um, Dylan was kind of like, okay, I got this. He's like trying to figure everything out. He's standing up and sitting down, standing up and sitting down. It's like, I don't know, but I'll figure it out. It's like, I just got to keep my brain working. I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I knew it all along. But it's kind of interesting, and it's actually scary, her whole situation. Because basically, this isn't her first kill. She's actually done it before. Like, she came here, changed her name. Because for her, it all seemed like it was more like a little game. Because it's like, oh, why did you do it? Why not? It's like, that's that's scary. She's just kind of, like, it's not even like we're diving into, like, oh, maybe something in her history made her the way she is. It's just kind of like, she's a sociopath, let's leave it at that. I guess it's like, we caught her killer. We don't need to leave. I, I don't know. The show seems like it is kind of asking why, which they did. But I guess it's like really understanding them. I don't know. Maybe that's something we'll see kind of dive in later on because it's kind of interesting too because like from the very beginning she was kind of like oh yeah i didn't really like that doctor lady she kind of gave me judgmental looks but you and me she was talking to dylan was like oh yeah i, I knew you and me we clicked i'm like what is that what does that say about dylan when the, the sociopath i mean to be fair that was more so to keep up her cover and everything but i did like dylan playing the angle being like oh yeah like she she's just she's waiting to kind of take credit she wants us to know it was her you know because she doesn't seem like she was the type because even like the way how the like the viciousness of the murders made it seem like it was a guy who did it. But we find out, well, the reason why there wasn't much of fighting back was because they were in a moment of intimacy when she ended up killing them, which is like, doubly, let's face it, doubly fucked up uh, that things got to transpire that way, which is su super sad on both accounts. I mean, the photographer seems like he was scummy in a sense. I mean, not scummy, scummy as the way Nikki was making him seem. I mean, it seemed like, oh, he took her back. So it's like, eh, who cares? So, but Caleb is like, Caleb comes from an ascetic community, a church. He was leaving that life uh, to be here. Because um, obviously with that life comes rules that you can't really follow. Like, for example, like the whole, like him being into music, he started sending a tape off to like, you know, go to Juilliard for his piano skills. Which the moment Dylan got those pops, I was like, mm, what are those sticks? I don't get it. And then he started laying them out. Even I was like, all those black, I was like, black and white. Are those piano keys? And they're like, piano keys? Like, yeah. I was like, that felt so good about getting that ahead of time. But that was such, that was kind of just sad. I mean, because it was a, something he had to keep secret from, not just, you know, from his family, because like in their church, like music is kind of considered a sin and stuff like that. So, um, plus, it's kind of interesting too, because Dylan himself kind of admits that he kind of saw a little bit of himself in, um, Dylan, uh, in, uh, Caleb, yeah, because, 
for him, it's like, from the way Dylan kind of talks about it, it seems like him and Caleb had a similar thing. Especially you could tell the way Caleb was talking about, oh yeah, very disapproving dad and stuff like that. I'm like, you're talking also from personal experience. Because even he talks about the fact that his mom was the only one that ever really understood him. He's like, I'm lucky I had a mom who understood me, which is like, oh, it's sad. So, which we haven't heard anything about, like, Dylan's parents before now, so... I guess that means things between him and his dad weren't that good just because, I guess, you know, Dylan being gay and everything. I guess that or just maybe – it might not even just be the gay thing. It might just be like in his mind, his in his dad's mind, maybe, you know, Dylan was kind of an oddball. He was just kind of a weird kid or something like, you know, something like that. But the mom, you know, moms will pass all that bullshit and love you for you, you know. I think it just comes from that nurturing aspect. But nevertheless, um, maybe that's something we'll kind of – dive into later on like i said it's only at the beginning of the series so i'm sure we're going to be tiptoeing towards that sooner or later at some point in time what also was creepy was the fact is that nikki when she was walking away gave him that smile and that's just like ugh. so that does make me wonder will they cross path or her real name's amber but i wonder will they cross paths with her anytime soon in the future i mean because i don't know how this show is going to sell up some of their like the people like are you know with typical stuff like this that's kind of like police procedural kind of crime dramas you wouldn't think so but to be fair this is like bait and interestingly enough i brought this up when i was talking about the watch list up for this but it was like um this show is actually bait and it says at the beginning it's based on a james patterson book which i haven't really read a lot of james patterson's book i've read like one of his uh alex cross books um i think it was was it double cross that i read like years ago I don't really remember the book that well, but it seems like, I mean, I don't know if, like, how this stacks up to the book, because I would assume that, like, what the book would be, like, one particular killer. Maybe there's cases in between, but, I mean, I don't know how the structure of the book is, you know. I'm sure they've made it a lot more procedural for the TV show, so. Like I said, I'm just curious, is it going to be a situation of coming across, like, one particular serial killer? Like, that's what I was wondering if, what the whole theme of the show was going to be about, but it turns out that's not the case. So I'm wondering, is, will he cross paths with people him and Lizzie have locked up? Like, like Amber, for example. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's just a one and done like she's a psychopath let's leave it at that type of thing so i also appreciate aesthetically how it looked when dylan did figure it out that kind of like it zoomed into his eye and just kind of that blue filter kind of just trying to figure everything piecing it together i wonder what we see that more often in a few or was it just in this particular episode because i just aesthetically liked how like that choice of design and filter of how that look i thought it was kind of a, a neat uh way to kind of represent him like oh like his light bulb moment you know so but um, it's not just about the case in this episode. We do uh, get to find out a little bit more about Lizzie. We get introduced to her sister, Katie. And you kind of figure something was up the moment like Lizzie started dumping all those bottles. Like, it's like, your sister's a drinker, isn't she? And it's like, no, not just a drinker, like an uh, alcoholic. Because, you know, it turns out Lizzie's mom was one. And back then, growing up, and it's something that, you know, uh, Katie kind of alludes to. Well, not alludes to. Actually talks about She's like, uh, that Lizzie was kind of like a second mother to her, her, her and that's because, you know, Lizzie had to balance that balance, you know, looking out for her sister while also looking after their mom who was kind of, I mean, we don't know beyond that, like, what really happened, whether her mom got better or she's still the same. Like, it's not a conversation that really comes up. So maybe that's something we'll kind of dive into later on. But obviously it causes problems because obviously Lizzie, I mean, uh, that Katie got drunk when she was in the cab, super drunk. And to the point she threw up and just kind of turned into a whole scene. So... Lizzie got caught. I guess, like, you know, it was Katie that called her, you know, because it turns out that's kind of their dynamic. Like, Lizzie kind of screws up. I mean, Katie kind of screws up, and Lizzie comes in and kind of fixes everything. She's like the older sister who, you know, has to make all the problems kind of go away a little bit. Um, that's just kind of who, you know, the kind of situation Lizzie's kind of found herself in just because of the, just the dynamic of her family. Even to the point that Dylan had to be like, you need to kind of break this cycle, not just for Katie, but also for you, because it's one of those situations where, like, if you don't, if you're always there to coddle and make everything go away and fix everything, she'll never learn. You never learn from your mistakes unless you're allowed to fail. And it's like, you know, Lizzie's always there to fix it. So um, it's like you owe that to her as well as yourself. And so Lizzie kind of puts the, her foot down, but obviously, like, her sister is like, oh, you're just judgmental. You know, it's just like, you're like, you try to tell everyone what to do with their lives, you know? And it's like kind of heartbreaking. So at first I was like, oh man, things between them aren't going to end well. But it turns out in the end, they do. Because we end up finding out like why. It's because uh, 
she actually stopped drinking, you know, Katie. She was actually 10 months sober. But then, because I knew there had to be more to the reason why she came because she was like, oh, I came here for a job. I was like, that has to be a lie. What are you covering up for? It's like, no, basically things kind of, things sort of go went down a drain for her. She got fired. Her boyfriend dumped her and everything. So she just came to Lizzie because she, because she, she wanted Lizzie to do what Lizzie just did and basically give her the, like, kind of, the kick in the boot to kind of like, hey, get herself up and kind of like, try, you know, fix herself up, you know? Um, cause Lizzie was kind of feeling bad cause she's like, I don't know how to actually help. I feel like I'm failing. It's like, no, you're doing what you're supposed to do. You helped me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get better, you know? Because the way, cause I think, it's not really, like I said, it's not really dived into, but I can only assume it's because Katie knows what, like, Lizzie had to deal with their, with their mom. You know, it's probably something even Katie saw. Like, so for her, it was probably a situation of, like, I don't want to go down the same route as mom. Like I said, what that really means, I don't know. Whether their mom's still the alcoholic she is, is she very self-destructive? Is she kind of like a mean-spirited mom? Like, you know, what her whole deal is, we don't know at this point in time. So we'll have to wait to kind of learn more about that. But I do appreciate the fact that it was like, no... Uh, it is good between them, so it's like maybe we'll see more of Katie in the future, but we are learning a little bit more about Lizzie's uh, dynamic, which it kind of makes sense, especially the way Lizzie is the way she is. She's very kind of like, oh, let me just handle everything. I'm kind of like in charge of everything. It, it kind of fits with her personality that we've already kind of established so far, so that was kind of neat. And another element I really liked is the whole situation with Andy and the bar. Uh, they're they're trying to get an investor. And he's like, mm, I'm not sure I can do this and I can do that. And then Dylan shut, stands up and is like, are you stupid? Shut up. The one thing that makes this place so amazing isn't the position or just the bar itself. It is Andy. Andy's the one that puts in so much work. He's the one that makes this all possible. So if you if you want anything, it should be Andy. So like, if you don't want to take this opportunity, you're out of luck, which I'm like, and then, like, Dylan kind of had to stop and kind of sit down because he felt embarrassed. I was like, oh, that's so sweet. That's so adorable. You're sticking up for him and everything. Like, he just, he's like, I, he's almost like, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. Like, this man here is amazing. If you're not, if you can't see that, then just go away. I just, it was just kind of sweet and adorable. And even Andy appreciated it. Even Andy kind of built upon that and gave the dude an ultimatum. It was like, okay, you got 48 hours of kind of buying in. If you don't, oh, well, we'll find someone else to do it. But obviously, this bar means a lot to not just Andy. It means a lot to them financially because they put a lot of money into it. Um, kind of, I actually forgot about that, but I think he had mentioned it like last episode, maybe even in the pilot about the whole him quitting his law uh, job, lawyer job to you know run a bar and everything. So that was kind of pretty neat. Um, and then you had Dylan saying the sweet thing of like, "You are the greatest investment I've ever made." I'm like, "Oh, shut up, Dylan! You're you're sweet talking stuff like that." But it turns out the investor is in and everything, and it's like, "Oh yeah, so that's good. They'll probably be able to do because obviously they're a little understaffed at the moment. Like how they talked about in the episode, kind of had to switch things around." But immediately with the whole investor thing, I'm like. Yeah, something's going to happen with that. There's a storyline there. I don't know what it is yet, but there's going to be a storyline there. Because, I mean, maybe it will turn out to be nothing, but I'm just waiting for, like, the other shoe to fall and be like, okay, there's going to be something with that. Because typically, my this is how my mind works for certain things. I'm like that. I always pull at things that might be something and turn out to be something, or I think they're going to might be something, and it's like, nope, turns out to be nothing at all. This might be something that turns out to be nothing at all, but I'm like, something's going to happen. We're going to find out that that guy is some, like, scammer or something like that, or, like, he does some illegal shit or something something like he launders money or something like it's i don't know man i think it's going to be it's just i get this big feeling it's just going to be something that kind of blows up in your face it might be something that's just a personal storyline that we see like a side beside a case in an episode or it might in fact be something we see as the case in an episode and andy and the bar kind of get wrapped up in that so i don't know like I said, maybe I'm reading way too much into it, or maybe I'm just like, that's the exact, I, either way, I'm excited to see, you know, if something will come of that or not, see if I'm right or not, so, but overall, a very nice episode, like I said, um, interesting developments, and a very interesting case, I did also like the end moment where they were showing the video to, um, Caleb's parents, and even, you can tell, even his dad was kind of like, um, like, oh, that's my son. I mean, he's wow, he's so, you know, didn't say it, but obviously with the way he said my son, I was like, oh, look at him, he's so talented. That even with the way they are, like, you know, even he can kind of put everything aside, their beliefs and everything, just to recognize, like, my son was amazing, my son was talented. Because at first it seemed like it didn't hit him as much, but at the same time it's like, depending on, you know, your culture and I guess, like, you know, who you are personally, everyone handles grief in their own way. Some people just want to work through their pain, and it seems like he might be one of those. Dudes. And you see it with um, Dylan, and I think that's the side of this uh, job that, you know, probably never quite 
you know, probably something we'll never see Dylan kind of get used to because you see it just this, you know, not necessarily desensitized to like these murders and stuff like that. But you can tell, you know, Lizzie is just one of those things where it's like, damn, it's another terrible thing. But for Dylan, it's just kind of like a, a new world is opened up to, I guess, because even in the CIA, day, CIA days, he probably never had to come across stuff like that. A lot of that's probably like espionage type of stuff. So it's probably never got as gruesome as a lot of murder. Like, I think they've mentioned it, but I keep blank like it goes over my head like what it is exactly Dylan did as an operative. Like was he more of an analytic dude? I mean the way they talk about it is almost like he was an agent. So like I said, it might be more espionage stuff. Or maybe it's just looking at the bodies kind of remind him of just his own, you know, what stuff he might have done in the CIA. But at the moment you see him like when um Caleb's parents are watching, you see him kind of tearing up a little bit, like a sad look on his face, and it kind of breaks your heart even more because it breaks your heart because it breaks Dylan's heart because you just realize just kind of like the sad situation around it like this is like a young kid who just this family lost their son you know and they'll never get him back you know and it's just i don't know i didn't mean to end this recording off on a bummer uh but it's just i just i don't know that was just kind of like floating through my mind so and now moving on to this week's episode of deception which i didn't even think about it until i started just Till I just press the record button, it's like, this is the perfect day to watch Deception, it being April Fool's Day and stuff like that. Uh, just uh, kind of perfect timing and stuff like that. But nevertheless, in this week's episode, we dealt with a murder that ended up being connected to an illegal arms dealer. In this case, there's a lady named Irene who's a psychic that died, and her helper was Vivian, which Vivian is stupidly good at reading people. It's, like, scary how good she is at kind of, like, the moment she was on the bridge with Kay, she was able to understand, like, from the way Kay was talking to her, to her just her demeanor and everything. It's like, oh, you've literally gone through this situation. You know what it's like to kind of lose someone that you feel like you could have. And basically seeing Kay's working so hard because she has to to kind of make up for the fact that she couldn't say, you know, and we know that to be her sister. But being able to get inside people the way she's able to, even like deciphering, like, oh, you call it an art, you said the way you talk about archive, it's not, you never had a home growing up. So this archive's like the closest thing you had to at home. He's like, I, I get it. It's the way you said, it's because of the way she said archive. And you had Kay being like, right. He said, I don't, I don't like the way you say it right. Cause I appreciate that in this episode too, because of it, because Kay's like, oh yeah, she's a psychic. She's like, Isn't that part of magic? He's like, what are you talking about? It's like, oh yeah, you know, magic. Psychics, that's all That's all magic. And he's like, no, 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 no. He's out there being like, no, no, no. They lie and deceive people. I've never done that. I mean, yeah, there's the whole me and John situation, but it's like, no, 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 no. We didn't. People knew they were getting tricked. I mean, to be fair, they thought it was one magician and not just two separate people, but that's besides the point. I just, because even though talking about it a little bit, basically, psychics and magicians have had like, rivalry for like hundreds of years like a hundred years or something like that it was kind of interesting hearing him kind of be because he was like super he's like come on like oh yeah because you know lying to people is a is a is a crime it's like oh actually no i mean even under circumstances it's not illegal you could make the argument it's shady but it's not illegal but uh nevertheless it turns out that Vivian was working for a guy named Miller who is basically an illegal arms dealer. Basically, she's very good at reading people and he's very, not as, I guess, superstitious in a sense of like he believes in a lot of like, because he grew up in China and basically a lot of the symbolism in China and a lot of lucky stuff, he kind of takes that as some of his own. So he's kind of adopted that. So he's very particular about how he does business and Vivian was kind of his main motive of business. And so... It seemed like he was trying to kill her. He's like, oh, maybe she has information. It's like, oh, she has information on some of his illegal business. It's like, no, he wants her back because she's his lucky charm. It's like, oh, he, she can see through, you know, any, you know, quote unquote friends, which are really business rivals, as well as, you know, tell him whether the, the signs look good to make a business deal. So that's what this whole thing was about. And I do appreciate the uh, FBI and the deception team working together to kind of orchestrate that whole thing. And it just, it always blows my mind with just the little bits that they're able to concoct. Like, we Gunter, Gunter was driving him around and all those eights popped up. Obviously, some were kind of on the side being like affinity symbols. But still, it's just the little things like that I love. Uh, setting up the fish thing, which in itself is a deception. Just kind of like, oh yeah, like making him focus. Like, oh, this looks so lucky while another thing was happening at the same time. Because I'll go ahead and talk about that gun switch that Jordan did. I thought, because I, cause I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, when, um... When, gosh, Cameron got knocked out, I was like, wow, you could, oh, you snapped out. I thought you'd be knocked out the entire time. It's like, oh, now it makes sense in retrospect because it's like it was a prop gun. So it probably still 
hurt, but it probably wasn't that bad. I mean, I guess it depends on the materials that was made from. Maybe the materials are not heavy enough, like metal, like a gun, but they're fashioned out of a sense to make him feel and make it have the weight of a gun. I would assume, I don't, I don't know, you know, it, it was a good prop, and it kind of makes sense. It's like, oh, wow. That was because I was like, I was like that's so crazy. Because most things you see people in that get pistol whipped, it's like, oh, they're out for a while. It's like, no, he was up pretty quickly, so that makes sense. I also appreciate the whole situation with the tiles that, uh, because I thought it was going to be some crazy stuff like, oh, man, they're out. And it's like, okay, so they knew exactly which one he'd pick. It's like, well, no, they got the symbol literally. I swear there was like one at the far end that didn't have the symbol, I think. But, I mean, I'm sure I was mistaken. But, like, most of them had the symbol. I could have swear there was at least one that didn't. But, nevertheless, it's kind of like, oh, it's a good sign. So, I thought that was kind of um, neatly done. But that all tied in with the fact is that, like, they faked her death. I was like, nah, I had a feeling. Because Miller himself said it, like, oh, like, you know, no matter what happens, I'll always find you. I'm like, okay. And then she struggles for the gun and ends up dying. I'm like, yeah, that has to be the fact. Nah, it's like, he, uh, that had to be on purpose. Like, she's faking her death. I knew it immediately, and it turns out to be the case. Um, even the whole situation with Jordan and Gunter uh, switching out the door, that was pretty impressive. It's like on a time clock. Uh, it's pretty impressive, too, because I was actually scared because obviously Gunter had to walk past him. But it's like, no, he already saw Gunter's face. So, I mean, that's I mean, maybe that's something we'll see kind of pop up in the show. It's kind of like, because um, I've already made comparisons between this and Leverage. But that's a storyline that came up in Leverage like once or twice where it's like, oh, you have certain people play different roles in kind of like uh, theft or like a or, you know, some kind of trick. And then people start picking those like, well, don't I recognize you from something else? Like, you know, you have to be careful about those type of things. But it was kind of a rush job. So obviously, every all hands on deck were for that situation. But as like, luckily, he was so focused on everything else, the good luck and everything. I guess he was kind of riding a high and everything that he was so focused, you know, maybe going to turn in just the right way that he didn't notice, you know, maybe because you also have to think about the fact is when he was in the truck, he was so focused on all the good signs he was seeing that maybe he wasn't paying too much attention to what Gunter looked like. So that's kind of another um, aspect to it. So it is interesting, too, because there's that moment Vivian had with Dina about the whole like um, love life and stuff like that, uh, which I can only assume that's going to end up with Mike. Because I just, just them kind of being flirty and stuff like that, the interactions between them and stuff like that. Uh, him being the one that's in the elevator with her near the end of the episode, leaning over like, it's it's going to be, it's all going to be okay, you know? Um, so it just, it seems like that to me. Because she's actually, I mean, the way she kind of talks about it, like the way, like, you know, Vivian talked about it, it was like, no, nah, she hasn't had much luck when it came to the love life situation. And obviously Gunter isn't all into it, much like Cameron was. But it turns out, like, Dina messed with him by telling, um, Vivian, his dad's name is like, it seems like Gunter is a secretive person. It does make you wonder what's up in his past that he, I mean, what made him like that? I even like this sweet moment at the end where she's telling Jordan, nah, try not to, try to go easy on Gunter. When he looks at you, he sees his son. He see, thinks of you kind of like a son. And he's like, well, really? And I guess in a sense, that's kind of true because the way he's kind of harsh to Jordan and stuff like that. It's like, no, 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 don't do it this way. It's like, you know, he's on, you know, Maybe that's maybe that kind of maybe that's his way of kind of showing love. Maybe that's kind of how him the kind of relationship in, him and his own father had. I don't know. I mean, it might be just reaching too far on that one, but nevertheless, because I do kind of like the overall concept of this episode, because it is the whole aspect of uh, psychics and stuff like that. But it's also the fact is of choosing your own destiny. You know, that's why Cameron doesn't really believe too much in psychics because he wants to make his own destiny, and that kind of inspired Vivian to kind of do what she does this episode, helping take down Miller, because it's like, hey. You know, I want to make my own choices, you know, because if she doesn't do this, like he's going to track her down eventually. And who's she doesn't want another innocent person kind of getting caught up in it, you know, everything. And I, I think that's kind of a nice parallel between her and um Cameron, because they both have been in that situation. Obviously, his situation is with John and hers was with, with the victim this episode, Irene. I even like the point is he's sitting on a couch flipping cards and Vivian's like, you know, I'm not a therapist, right? He's like. Yeah, I know, but I think for him it's still nice to kind of have someone to talk to. But I think maybe at some point in that he forgot. I also love it with the FBI agent when they, when Cameron was switching all that stuff in his hand, and the guy was like, "It's gonna be a no, it's, it better not be like a horseshoe in your hand next." And he's like, "What? Come on, that's stupid. I wouldn't do something like that." But Jordan goes behind him and pulls the horseshoe out of his backhand. I'm like, "That's so good." Uh, I was like, "Cause when the moment the dude said that, I was like, what? You, you think he's gonna put a horseshoe in it? No way!'" And then he had it behind. I was like, "Oh, wow, this dude knows his stuff."
Uh, I mean, to be fair, it was like, well, he was trying to make all the like lucky items, and I guess it's like, if the guy, I guess it was him being kind of embarrassed. Was like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to give the dude satisfaction of knowing exactly what I had in my, uh, you know, my, up my sleeve, essentially. So, but another everything that kind of dealt also dealt with um, John's side of things, where obviously because of last episode. John got the attention of a dude we now know his name is Winslow. Winslow is not afraid of, you know, getting physical with uh, John to get what he wants. Basically, he wanted John's help to break someone out of the hospital. Even gave John, like, a broken rib just to get him in the same medical place as a dude so he can break out. That was a pretty neat, like, setup and everything, too. Making everything seem like it's the guy that ran away when really the guy's next in um, John's bed sleeping, well, quote unquote sleeping, and then like John jumps down, closes the door, dude gets away, and John gets back in bed like, oh man, what are you talking about? What's all this noise? Oh man, I had no idea what was going on. It's pretty neat. It shows how skilled he is. Sadly, as I already knew it was going to be, the whole Winslow situation is going to be a continuing thing. Obviously, John doesn't want to get involved, but he won't really have much of a choice in the matter because, and it's something him and Cameron talk about this episode, like Cameron can't know what you know, John's going through under these circumstances, but it's just like, you know, and Cameron already feels responsible enough. So he wants to try and, you know, he wants to make sure that John is okay, that even though things are rough, that he's okay. And it's something Vivian told him in this episode to like, look in his eyes and see if there's a flicker in his focus. And, you know, initially Cameron was kind of okay. I think with everything, he was just kind of like, okay, I don't have to worry about it. But then John dropped the coin when he was flicking it through his fingers. It's like, you lost your focus. He's like, well, no one's perfect. And he sees a lot. If it sinks in, it's like things aren't okay with um, John. Because let's not forget, he already we already discussed, wasn't it last episode? I think it was last episode when he talked about the fact is that um, he'd already created all these different plans on how to actually break John out of prison if he needed to. Which obviously he lied to Kay about any ideas he had. So... I wonder would this motivate him even more because he knows like, oh, his brother is being pushed into a corner. And it's like, what can I do? We got to hurry up and find this lady so we can prove his innocence. But, you know, like I said, like that's plan A. Plan B is just to break him out. Like that's not going to be a good thing because they will be on a run. Even Cameron will be on a run because they'll no doubt think like, oh, the only reason, only way John could have escaped is if he had a little help. And you being the master of deception, of course, you would have had something to do with him. And I'm curious. What I'm also curious about is, does the rest of the team know anything about his plans, or is that just stuff he's been working on his own? And, um, it's actually interesting, too, because I just thought about it. This episode, he didn't actually work with John. Because so far, he's been kind of working on um, plans with John, but this time it was just 100% with the uh, just the deception team. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Like, obviously, the team kind of like fine-tunes a lot of the stuff, kind of puts forth a lot of the, like, the props and certain angles of the deception, but it's like the overall planning is usually like Cam and John, but I guess that's something we're going to be seeing over the course of the uh, series. It's just like, a, oh yeah, some stuff Cam han Cameron handles on his own, so. Like I said, it does make you wonder what kind of stuff will Cameron, I mean, John have to be doing for Winslow. Um, obviously, this is kind of like one thing of like, oh, helping a dude escape, but who's to say what else is going on? I mean, because if something, if it all gets trailed back to John, he's just going to run, like, it's just going to make things worse for him, probably get it harder for him to get out of prison. Um, like I said, what is this going to do for Cameron? Because this might motivate him to kind of get a little more reckless to kind of help, you know, to, at, like, you know. I mean, because it's kind of interesting because he told, well, he says K, but he says the FBI, but and, but he does go, like, I told you, K's amazing, which is like, yeah, K's the only one that's really, really helping him. I don't know if they're necessarily putting forth the FBI resources. I'm sure K is, but, you know, I don't know if the other FBI teams are really, like, even Mike and the others are really helping well, that maybe secretly they are, but it seems like more so right now it's Kay. But, I mean, like I said, Cameron kind of gave her an acknowledgement in this episode being like, yo, Kay's awesome, it, you know, so. Because what was also interesting, because Vivian was saying, like, oh, there's darkness in him. Obviously, that's because she thought she was talking to Cameron, but obviously Cameron gave her John's information. But, like, I, I initially was like, oh, we're talking about, like, John having a darker side, which we kind of saw that last episode when he was kind of like, oh, you know, uh, don't 
like basically was threatening that dude to not cross him or something like that. Don't threaten him again. So I was thinking like, okay, so prison is going to make him grow a darker side, but maybe it's not necessarily just like something inside of John's going to turn dark. That could be one potential route that it could have been alluding to. But the other part of me is like, well, there's basically dark forces around him. Basically, they're going to be what ends up snuffing him out, essentially, that things are just going to keep wearing him down. You know, I mean, it could coincide with just being like, oh, like he's going to be kind of trapped in his dark. He's stuck in his dark place of like, you know, he's not built for prison, but prison, you know, he's stuck in this unfortunate situation and it's just going to keep beating him down until it breaks him or is going to keep beating him down until like it shifts him into like instead of being the person that he is, that maybe when it's all said and done, kind of like what I was alluding to earlier just now was like he won't necessarily be the same person that the darkness will kind of get inside of him and he'll just be kind of like not the same John anymore that he'll be someone else like I said it's just it's just kind of interesting because it almost does seem like they are doing kind of an interesting thing where it's like cameras kind of all like all the light uh while John's kind of dealing with all the darkness it just kind of seems like they're kind of comparing and contrasting with the twins like that it's just kind of an interesting thing that was kind of flowing through my mind and I feel like that could be an angle they'd be going for it might just be more of a figurative sense like I was bringing up but I still think the literal sense could be kind of you know seen as well but either way I'm very interested to see where all this takes us in the next episode but really that's all I want to talk about to the next time we meet be happy be safe live life to the fullest and enjoy it good day and goodbye